are live. And it's just us. We have nobody. <laughs> okay. I'm starting. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast, a conversation between chefs, Esther Che and Judy Ju. I'm Tom Byrne, president of the Korea Society. And I'm reaching you live working from home in New York City, where almost all businesses, including the restaurants, remain locked down. While Delhi life is returning to a state of normalcy in Seoul and other cities, particularly in East Asia, life here in New York City remains abnormal. Under these circumstances, to those essential workers who go out to work every day, if you are watching, uh, we just want to say thank you for all you do. And to thank everyone, uh, members of the Korea Society and its friends, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome chefs Judy Ju and Esther Che uh, to the Korea Society. Esther is zooming in from New York City and Judy from London. Esther Che is the owner and founder of New York City's Milk Bar with locations in Chelsea Market and in Brooklyn. With a personal passion for introducing New Yorkers to the flavors of Korean culture, Chef Esther's cooking combines traditional and modern influences with fresh seasonal ingredients. Chef Esther was formally trained in New York's Institute of Culinary Education and has worked across diverse kitchens, including La Esquina and the Food Network. Esther has received numerous awards for her culinary pursuits and was named New York City's culinary rock star in the guts 30 under 30. <clears throat> she also has a plan for her fourth restaurant, which is scheduled to open not too far from the Korea Society's office in Mad on Madison Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Judy Ju earned an engineering degree at Columbia University and leaving behind a career on Wall Street, she took a courageous career shift enrolling at the French Culinary Institute. Her expertise in Korean cooking led her to her own TV shows, Judy Ju's Return to Korea, and two seasons of Korean Food Made Simple. Judy also starred in Iron Chef UK, securing the title Iron Chef UK. In 2014, she opened the doors to her award-winning modern Korean restaurant with three locations globally. In 2019, Judy published her second cookbook, Korean Soul Food, and she's planning to open a new venture in London called Soul Bird. Welcome Esther and Judy to the Korea Society. We are thrilled to have you with us this afternoon. Joining them today is Jay O, oh, our Arts and Culture Director, who uh, has done a terrific job since she's come to the Korea Society, both in normal and abnormal times, to enhance our programming, book talks, and exhibitions in our on-premises art gallery. Jay? Okay. Thanks, Tom, for the introduction. Welcome, Judy and Esther. Thank you for joining Hello. us in the Korea Society. Thank, us. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, before we start our conversation, I want to remind our viewers that we are accepting your questions for Chef um, Esther Choi and Judy Ju. You can tweet your questions at Korea Society Art or send us a question via email to arts, cult arts and culture at koreasociety.org. And as many of you know, we planned this conversation back in March at our event space in front of a live audience. And for obvious reasons, we had to postpone it. And we are grateful that chefs um, Judy and Esther have agreed to do this as a live webcast. And I believe many of you who had RSVP for that March event are watching today. So thank you for joining us. And I guess we cannot not talk about the reason we had postponed this conversation. So I simply want to start by asking, Judy, how are you? How are things in London? Um, I'm good. Uh, thankfully, I'm healthy and well. Um, London's quiet, I'm sure, as is New York City. Um, you know, we're in lockdown here still, um, seventh or eighth week, I think we are. And um, yeah, it's interesting times. I never thought I'd be living through a pandemic, but thankfully, I'm healthy and well. Yeah. Yeah. And Esther, you are in your apartment in New York. How have yes. you been doing? I'm sorry, you, what was that? How have you been doing? It's been it's been rough, you know. Um, it's wow. not like we have the luxury of having like a 
big yard or a big house. So kind of being cooped up in a small space, it's been pretty challenging, but um, overall I'm healthy. So I'm thankful for that. Right. Yeah. But that's the most important thing that both of you are healthy. Um, Esther, we saw that Mokbar actually started doing a delivery service too. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so we just started this week, actually. Um, so we take orders via email. Mm -hmm. And then we've been, you know, doing curbside delivery and pickup. But um, I, I realize it's, it's very challenging. You know, there's not only a lot of competition out there, it's, it's just tough to kind of have to pivot and restart your entire business. So I feel like everything that I've done in the past six years have kind of been wiped out. And um, it feels like I'm opening like a new concept all over again. So it's been challenging, but um, you know, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be able to do it still. And um, we're, me and my team, we're working hard. We're Great. pushing through. And everybody's healthy. That's most important. Yes, everyone's healthy. And I'm grateful that my team wants to come out and still, you know, work and, you know, we have a long way to go and uh, but you got to start somewhere. So we just, we know that New York's probably going to start opening little by little soon. So we, we kind of want to get a head start. Great, makes sense. And I don't want to dwell too much on the subject of the pandemic, but just like many of us, you've been cooking a lot at home. Um, Judy, what have you been cooking at home? Um, I've actually been baking a lot. <laughs> I've been making a lot of bread, um, uh, different types of things. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been doing a lot of cooking. I mean, obviously some, some Korean things too. Esther and I made tteokbokki together not that long ago. Um, I, uh, I received some, a gift, uh, some, a gift of caviar recently. So I've been cooking with caviar um, mm -hmm. recently, but um, yeah, it's a lot of seasonal things. I got some wild garlics. So I was cooking with that. Um, so not just Korean things, things, things um, across um, all different cultures. And, um, but I have to say, I've really fallen in love with, um, with bread making again. Yeah. Yeah. And Esther, I saw um, in one of your social media postings in which you basically inhaled lots of dumplings. And I wish I have to say, I wish I could have eaten those with you. They looked amazing. Um, what have you been cooking other than dumplings? Um, I have been cooking a lot of dumplings. Um, <laughs> I'm like going to become a dumpling soon myself. <laughs> Just, um, I, I love dumplings so much. So I just been like making all different types and that's been fun. Um, but I, I guess like doing a lot of things that I've always wanted to cook, but I like in my head, but never been able to like really <clears throat> do because just been so busy. Um, but it's really been great to kind of get back on stove, you know, like when you're an entrepreneur, I guess you just, um, you, you get busy, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of other things and cooking almost became like a luxury at um, at some point. And I haven't been able to cook for that much as much as I want to actually for past few years. So it's been really nice to just, just like mindlessly cook whatever and just like write recipes and kind of cook with other chefs like me and Judy have been doing and we want to do another one very soon. Um, it's, it's been really fun to just, um, go back to the stove and kind of go back to why I started, um, the restaurants in the first place. So, right. And this, speaking of cooking at home, I think this idea of home cooking is very important to both of you, even though you are both, you know, highly trained chefs. Um, both of you actually grew up in the U S actually in New Jersey, um, as Korean Americans and both of you <laughs> Yeah. Girls. Um, yeah, and especially Esther, you mentioned a lot about your grandmother as a major influence in your cooking. So can you tell us a little bit about your grandmother and her cooking? Yeah, so my grandma was always kind of like the leader in our town. Like I grew up in South Jersey, not many Koreans, but um, the Koreans that were living there kind of congregated at church all the time. And my grandma was always the leader of the kitchen and she was just this like badass cook, like all, always taking care of everyone and feeding all the families and always kind of making um, like a celebration out of cooking. And um, like we grew up 
in a house with like a huge backyard. So she would like garden all of her own vegetables and she would make kind of like everything from scratch. And it was kind of because we didn't really have access to Korean ingredients. So she would have to kind of like make it her own. And I grew up like watching her do that and really, really loving it. Um, my siblings, not so much. It was always me kind of wanting to always be a part of that. And I think that had like a big influence in why I cook, why I love to cook and why I love Korean food, especially so much. Mm. And Judy, also in the introduction of your second book, Korean Soul Food, you talk a lot about your mom's home cooking. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like for you growing up in New Jersey? Uh, you know, it, it sounds like um, Esther's experience with, with her grandmother, um, quite similar, because back then you couldn't buy any thing pre-made you know if you wanted keem you had to buy like the dried seaweed sheets and then you had to put oil on them brush oil on them put salt on them and then fry them and all these things and um you know you couldn't buy kimchi you, you had you had to make it you know so my mom um was literally you know doing everything from drying chilies in the sun to growing kenyip in our in our backyard and uh, making kimchi and making shike, making, making absolutely everything from scratch. Um, our house smelled really funky. <laughs> and um, I still remember like all different types of things being in the laundry room, but, um, and every now and then, you know, we'd get these massive packages from Korea, which, you know, had everything in them from, um, you know, gochujang to tenjang to like dried persimmons to um, different types of seaweed and milk and, um, yeah, and, and my mom just like being so excited to get some, you know, raw ingredients from Korea so that she could um, make them into something delicious. And did you like it? Did you like Korean oh, food? Oh, I loved it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always loved Korean food. Um, it's, it, uh, you know, I was, it was my after school snack. I, I grew up eating so much Korean food. My mom um, pretty much cooked Korean food almost exclusively. So it was, it was my, um, my go-to and still is my go-to comfort food. Yeah. You know and that like our parents and our grandparents, they're super resourceful when it comes to mm -hmm. Korean food. Um, I, I remember my grandma, she randomly uh, found this large patch of like kosari that was growing in like some random street oh, yeah. in, our, in our town. <laughs> and she literally called like all the church ladies and we would like just go there and forage all this like was that it? Yeah, that's so yeah. funny. I thought that was yeah. like an urban legend. I've heard that yeah. story so many times. The gra Korean grandmothers finding finding like wild ferns, basically, right? And then yeah, yeah. Just like forage and just like um, oh, was, and acorns, picking all the acorns up to make more yeah. and like all this it, stuff, yeah. And sometimes in like a neighbor's backyard, which was trespassing, yeah. but they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. And then Judy, so you went to college and had a career in Wall, on, on Wall Street, and then you decided to enroll in cooking school. So yeah. what was the sort of the tipping point to quote Martin? Um, you know, it was really, I just, I just didn't love finance and it just wasn't for me. I was working like crazy. I didn't have a passion for it. And um, I, I just, I was like, you know what? I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Like I, I have to actually like my job um, and I don't like my job. <laughs> and so even though I was, um, you know, qu quite, quite good at it, I worked hard and everything. I just didn't want to read um, about fixing derivatives in the economy and, you know, about the markets, all that stuff in my free time, I was always gravitating towards cookbooks and cooking magazines and just wanting to, um, you know, find out what was going on. And, and back then, you know, it was, it was the zag, Zagat's Guide. I just still remember when the Zagat's Guide came out and like always like and reading it like it was a book, you know, I was like obsessed with like restaurants and like different dishes. And and so um, for me, it was actually quite easy um, when when I was like, you know, I, I, I don't want to do finance anymore. It was quite easy for me to decide what my next career was going to be. So that, that's why I went into cooking. Somebody actually sent in a question before we started, and I thought it was the tip of such a Korean question. Um, she asked, um, what did your parents think? <laughs> oh, yeah. My parents were not happy at all. Like, at all. Like, zero. I'm sure, Esther, your, your parents weren't, weren't happy either. You How know, old were you when, when you decided to I do was, I was um, 28, 29 when I went to cooking school. Okay, yeah. so still kind of young. So, yeah, your parents were yeah. like, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, particularly after, you know, like they had, you know, like I had like tiger parenting, you know, like uh, it's like three piano lessons a week. And, and, you know, they're like, like basically like telling me if, if my sister and I didn't go to certain schools, we like cast shame on the family and all this stuff for generations. And like, and so, you know, for, for them to become a chef was like, are, are you kidding me? You know, like all of our bragging rights go away. You want to do this like, like low class, you know, blue collar work. And how much did we spend on your education for you to do this? Like we sacrifice so much and, you know, you're being ungrateful and <laughs> everything. But um, I was just like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, I mean, at that, that time I wasn't, uh, you know, th they weren't paying for, for, for my life at all. You know, I was living on my own. I was paying for, you know, my, my room and board and a roof over my head and all my food. So I was like, you know, this is, this is my life. So I'm going to do what I want to do. How about you, Esther? You did, um, why did you be, decide to become a chef? Um, so I actually went to school for pharmacy at Rutgers and that was not my choice at all. That was my parents' choice and they practically forced me to um, go to Rutgers for pharmacy. Um, I think I applied for like Parsons. I wanted to go towards a more creative route because that I've been creative my whole life and that's like what I wanted to do. But um, they were very um, persuasive. So, so I did end up going, but after two years, I decided to drop out and um, I still wanted my degree. So I, I, um, I ended up with a, far, uh, psychology degree, they didn't find out that I dropped out until when I was graduating. So I didn't tell them, which was, um, I guess not, not very good, but I knew that they would freak out at me. So I didn't, I kind of like hit it. And then I um, came to day of graduation like that week. I was like, okay, so I'm graduating this month. And my parents like freaked. They were like, they were so confused, but I did a lot of crazy things like that I was kind of like a very rebellious kid so um I think at a certain point they kind of just let me do what I wanted and then um I and then I ended up uh working in like marketing for a bit in corporate and I hated it so I just like didn't understand the point of working in corporate because I felt like an ant in like a big ant factory like I didn't make any impact I like hated what I was doing I didn't understand it at all so I was like, okay, I'm gonna just like do what I want. And I know that it's cooking. So I ended up moving to New York and going to culinary school. And I think by then my parents were kind of just like over it. Like I always like drop these bombs of like crazy surprises. And um, after a while um, they still freak out, but in the end they know that I'm just gonna do what I wanna do anyway. So it was kind of like that, like culinary school and then I worked as a line cook, they hated that. And then I went to Food Network and went back to corporate because that's, I thought that I wanted to do that, but then I realized like, oh, this is very corporate. I, I actually don't want to do this. Um, so when I told them I'm leaving Food Network to uh, go and uh, cook again as, a, as like a cook in a restaurant, they, I remember my mom getting so mad at me, like, just like, she didn't understand it. Like, why would you, you went through all this stuff to like, get that job. Like, why are you going back to the restaurants? Like, I don't understand it. And, um, it was really tough because she like started crying and it was like a really hard decision for me, but I just, I just had to continue to cook. And mm -hmm. I wasn't doing much of that at the food network. So, um, I ended up leaving and since then, many more surprises, but she was over it by then. I think that that when I said I'm going back to the restaurants, she just that was like it for her. She was like, do whatever you so want. For her, for yeah. her, you would never work out like that was like a real job. And it was a real job. Like she was like proud to say that her daughter worked at Food Network, blah, blah, blah. But uh, when I ended up leaving, she just like really, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I'm sure they're all very proud of you now, right? Yeah, I mean, they didn't believe me when I told them before I'm 30, I'm going to open my restaurant. Um, and I said that in my early 20s, and they just obviously didn't really believe me. And then I went and did that. So so um, let's talk a little bit about um, the formal training in cooking, because I would imagine that you both received sort of the cooking 
training in French tradition because that's what most culinary schools are. So have you ever thought about when you are exploring this idea of cooking school and becoming a chef and working in the food industry, have you ever, was it always going to be Korean food or was it, have you thought about doing, as Judy, you mentioned you love baking and I know that you do a lot of different things too. So have you ever thought about it or was it all, always going to be Korean food in some form or the other? Is it me? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if, for me, I, I, um, I just felt it was really important that you have to cook what you love and um, I love to eat Korean food <laughs> and I love the flavors and so um, I really wanted to cook Korean food and um, it was it was just very clear to me and I, I felt that um, particularly with my bicultural upbringing being Korean American I could um, you know kind of take the best of both worlds and um, create a, a kind of a, a fusion type of cuisine and um, you know, put, put my own personal twists on Korean food and um, make it more modern or contemporary, whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I always wanted to do Korean food because that's just ultimately what I love to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in your latest cookbook, Korean Soul Food, you actually have a whole chapter that is named Comex. And yeah. you also have kimchi lamb biryani, which I thought was really great idea and kimchi mac and cheese and um, mm. all the, that sort of brings everything together. So obviously yeah. not just your American upbringing, but also living in London now, maybe yeah. that influences your cooking. Oh yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, it's all, uh, everyone's influenced um, when they're chef by, by any, any type of, um, you know, experience that they have. And traveling is, is, is a big part of that. Um, I know that when Esther came to London to, to visit me, she, you know, we ate all over the place. And, and that's always a, a big inspiration is, is um, just trying food all, all over the world. And obviously living in London, you know, there is a large Indian community here. And so um, I'd actually been asked to do um, a dish as part of an, an event um, at an Indian restaurant to come up with my own biryani and um this is what I came up with and it turned out so good I was like I'm gonna put this in my book it's so awesome and so we did this biryani with like kimchi fried rice but used um Indian rice in there and then we did this lamb and then um, I made this raita um but we used like a Korean style um pickle with like yuzu it, it was it was so good um but it just shows you that the mixing of flavors and um ingredients and spices can can work really well across the globe yeah that sounds so good i need to make that yeah it sounds yeah, it's good it's really about, good yeah how about you esther um you also trained at a lot of different restaurants i believe like one was lebanese and you work also worked at a mexican restaurant so um and you actually you called miss you uh, one of your restaurants a gastropub um, how do all these different trainings and influences come together in your Korean food? Um, I think for me, I like to definitely keep um, the flavors very traditional when it comes to Korean food, uh, just because that's what I like to eat. And I think Judy said it really well, like chefs want to cook what they want to eat. And that for me is has always been Korean food. Like I want to eat Korean food literally 24 seven, that's all I crave. And um, I've been told my palate is like super like ajoshi and harmony put together. <laughs> um, so I, I love, I, I just love the traditional flavors of Korean. That's what really gives me a lot of inspiration, like watching um, Korean documentaries on food. Uh, that's what I like to do on my free time. And I get really inspired by like very, very traditional way of like, um, cooking Korean food. Uh, but like, of course, there's other influences because I am an American in the end, right? So growing up as a Korean American, you still want to uh, kind of fuse that. And it's it's what we know, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's who we are. We are Korean American. We're our own like category of like mm -hmm. people. So definitely. Yeah. And, and food is always evolving. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not it's not like static you know um i always say that today's invention is tomorrow's tradition and it's it's very true in food exactly and like we live in such a multicultural city both of us mm -hmm. so like we can't help but to be influenced by all of our surroundings 
So, um, yeah. And for me to like cook Lebanese food and Mexican food, that all was kind of like by chance, just because of um, the chefs I knew and like um, the school I went to. So it was all kind of chance. It was by chance. It's not like I chose like, oh, I want to cook Lebanese food. Let me go work at this restaurant. It wasn't like that at all. It just fell on my lap. And um, I fell in love with uh, that kitchen. So I ended up working there. It was more like that. And then it, they just all happened to, to be ethnic cuisines though, in the end, mm -hmm. because I think that's what I, I really love. I love the th different ethnicities. I love like different cultures and it just really inspires me. And in the end, um, I wanted to do that with my own food, which was it's Korean food. Mm -hmm. So I think like, being like very strong in your own um, culture, that was what kind of inspired me with mm -hmm. the other um, restaurants that I worked at. So I was gonna ask this actually later, but I think it will tie in kind of with this, the way our conversation was going. Um, Judy, one of your TV show was actually called Return to Korea, um, where you went and visited different regions and different restaurants in Korea and, you know, sort of exploring that side of um, Korea. But how do you feel when you visit Korea? Do you see any difference between how you approach your Korean food versus what's going on in Seoul right now? I mean, obviously, Seoul is a very much an international city too these days, and there are lots of different influences coming. But. Oh, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, just because I am I, I'm American, you know, I was born and bred in America and culturally I am American, like in Korea, um, you know, I feel like a foreigner, even though I don't look like one. And in America, you know, I look like a foreigner, but I don't feel like one. And so um, in, in Korea, and I'm sure Esther, you know, f feels that this, the same way to, to a certain extent, you know, um, I'm not culturally Korean Korean you know mm -hmm. and um and my cousins and my relatives say that they can even just tell by the way I walk and my mannerisms that I'm not Korean <laughs> from Korea <laughs> and um you know so um and and with that like I see the world differently be because of that because um my, my my upbringing has been so different and also I've been living in London for about 15 years well, obviously you know I, I go back and forth between New York and, and London a lot um but the lens that I, I I have is is totally different because I you know I'm not living in Korea and so when I see different ingredients and I try different spices and everything it it, it is um, always um, different you know but I think it it works in my favor though because whenever you're trying new ingredients and it doesn't matter what country or culture you're in you try it without knowing. I guess, quote unquote, the rules around it. Like you're supposed to use this, this dish. I try it for what it is. And if it's spicy, salty, sweet, tea, you know, whatever, I was like, oh, this would be great on this, you know? And, um, and you know, I think that that um, helps when it comes to um, creation and, and innovation and um, using things in, in ways that are unexpected. How about you, Esther? Do you get to visit Korea? Like, did, does the restaurants or the food culture there inspire you in a different way? Um, so the last time I was in Korea was last fall. And I haven't been to Korea in like years before that, like for like four or five years. And when I went last fall, I just like thought to myself, I, I don't understand why I don't come more, go more often. You know, like I should go to Korea at least like twice a year just to even, you know, just for um, even seeing like the changes that are happening, even discovering new foods and being inspired because it is such a, such an inspiring city or a country when it comes to food, um, especially for us, obviously, because we're Korean. Um, yeah. But it's like kind of amazing how advanced Korea's like food scene is. I every like when I went last fall, I was kind of shocked. I was like, oh my gosh, it, there's so many new things, yet um, so many like uh, traditions as well, still like that are still living. And I feel like Korea is such a like rich food culture. It's it's amazing. And even the programming that you see on TV, it's just like so much more advanced. I feel like they're very ahead. A lot of, with a lot of things so yeah it, it's very inspiring it's a little scary though because I feel like a lot of the like old markets or like the real traditions um might die and go away 
mm. after like let's say like the next generation next generation passes and that's what i'm always kind of scared of um but yeah that's why that's why we need like more younger um mm -hmm. chefs and cooks to really go back to the roots yeah that's uh, that sounds like a good idea um let's go back to a little bit talking about your own restaurants. Um, a lot of times, not all chefs actually own their own restaurants. And a lot of the times um, it takes them a while to actually plunge into that business side. Um, but Esther, as you mentioned, you opened your first restaurant when at a fairly young age, right? Um, what made you decide to get into that business side? Was it just your dream always that you knew that you're gonna have your own restaurant or? Um it was not necessarily a restaurant that was my dream. It was always um, having my own business. So um, since a very young age, I've always kind of been entrepreneurial. Like I've, I was that kid that sold candy to like my neighbors for an extra buck. Like, um, so I always knew that I wanted to start my own business. I just didn't know what it would be until later on when I decided to start cooking. Um, so yeah, so I ended up opening my first restaurant at 28 and it was kind of by chance. I, I felt like I wasn't quite ready, but then before that, around when I was like 24, 25, I had a chance to open my restaurant, uh, a restaurant, buy out a restaurant that's actually currently Oiji. I was supposed to buy that space. Um, but then I had the opportunity to get a full-time job at Food Network. So I ended up doing that instead. And it, because I've always felt like you could always start a business even later on. Mm -hmm. But an opportunity like working at the Food Network probably wouldn't come again. So um, yeah, so years later, I did end up opening a mock bar in Chelsea Market. But that was also um, a fierce like competition to even uh, do that. And in, if it if I didn't get the space, I probably wouldn't have done that, and I would have probably kept working at restaurants as you know sous chef, working my way up to executive chef. But because that opportunity came on my lap, I I decided to go for it. And since you opened your first restaurant in 2014, um, or just in general, just last few years, the Korean restaurant scene in New York seems to have really exploded. Um, what do you think happened? I mean, did you see it coming? Did you like feel sort of felt that there are all these things happening? You just mentioned Oiji and all these other restaurants. Um, what do you think happened in the last few years? I think it was inevitable for Korean food to blow up eventually. Um, I, I kind of was at the start of that. Um, there was one other restaurant that was doing it. It was Tanji. Huni was um, doing that. And um, I saw that and then I was like, oh yeah, like definitely Korean food is about to blow up. Um, so I didn't really like think like, oh, uh, um, it's gonna be crazy, blah, blah, blah. But it was when kimchi and gochujang, like these Korean ingredients started like um, coming up in different like publications, magazines, um, TV shows. It started trickling in into the culture, like American culture. And I knew something was about to happen. And I knew this because I, it was like my job to know. I was working at the Food Network and, you know, obviously you're always supposed to be on top of trends. So I, I knew that kimchi, gochujang, all these Korean things were starting to trickle into um, our American culture. And I knew that it was, it was bound to happen, inevitable. I just didn't know to, to this extent. It like really kind of just like really took off. Mm -hmm. um, I, when, when I started Mukbar, people were, you know, very interested. They were like, what, what is Korean food? Like a lot of people didn't even know what Korean food was. And then since then, so many Korean restaurants opened, um, a lot of Michelin star chef, uh, restaurants. And it's been pretty incredible to see. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, really amazing. But Judy, we're not as familiar with the restaurant scene in London. And I would think that it's slightly different over there. Um, what oh, was yeah. it like for you to open a Korean restaurant in London? What was the sort of the um, expectation? Were there any expectation? Oh, it was, it was a complete um, shock because the best food critics in the country compare me to Thai food and yeah. Thai restaurants. And uh -huh. I could not believe 
how ignorant they were um and you know I mean and, and like I did a, I did an interview with one of the top food people yesterday and he was talking about Korean soul food and he's, he's asking me he's like well you know what why do you call it soul food because soul food is for countries that are like cold and I was like Korea gets cold we just had the winter he thought Korea was in Southeast Asia you oh, know so yeah. I am constantly mm. dealing with he, I don't know. I don't understand it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, under, I was like, look, it's not as if Korea is not in the news. You know what I mean? It's not as if Korea is like a country that you never hear about or doesn't have companies that you never hear about. I mean, every single person has something by Samsung or LG or, you know what I mean? Or, and I, I just, so it was a real education here. And I was, you know, constantly getting in fights with the press and people. And I was like, this is Korean food. You have no right to compare it to Thai food. Um, if you look at a map, we don't share any ingredients. And, and they will even say, oh, you know, like, yeah, I, I, like, I, I like Judy's restaurant, but I like this other restaurant better. And they share a lot of the same ingredients. And that's a Thai restaurant. You know, I was like, what does Thai food have in common with Korean food? Like, and for even somebody to even say that, it makes no sense whatsoever and, and comparing Korean fried chicken to Thai chicken wings. And, and so I, I, I've had to really um, educate people and it's been a, a very, very, very frustrating. And also with that, you know, if that's like somebody who's, it's their full-time job to understand food, can you imagine the general public? So the general public would come in and they would, you know, sit down and demand, you know, like lo mein or pad thai. And I'm like, I don't have lo mein or pad thai, you know, so it's been a huge, huge education. I mean, now it's getting better and people, you know, kimchi is everywhere and people kind of know what Korean food is, you know, but still um, there is a lot of misconception and, um, you know, a, a lot of naivety and, and ignorance around Korean food, but I'm, I'm changing it. <laughs> I'm changing it. <laughs> That's what's so interesting because like you would think, I would think that Europeans are more like globalized a little bit, you know, but it's kind of amazing that, you know, in Chelsea Market, we have a ton of tourists and the Europeans are the ones that are really confused about Korean food. They just like, they oh, don't yeah. understand. They're totally. like, what is, what is Korean food? Like, I've never heard of that before, ever. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. I mean, I always get asked, like, are, am I from North Korea or South Korea? I'm like, I'm oh, from God. North Korea. Still? I, like, I get asked this Still? all the time. Still, it's, it's just... Yeah, I don't know. I just, I just find it crazy. Yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's because um, there are not as many immigrants who live in? Yeah, I, I think that that's a big, big yeah. part of it because there's such a small Korean community right. that lives here, and and there, there isn't a Korea town in London. You know, you have to go out to, to New Malden, which is like an hour and a half away, to mm -hmm. to get to where any Koreans live, and so you know, people know what Chinese food is, they know what Japanese food is, and they know what Thai food is. Everything else is lost, completely lost, yeah. That's really interesting, because you, you know, you always think of London as a very cosmopolitan and international. Well, place. it is, but they just, um, for some but, reason, you know, uh, when it comes to understanding and recognizing the cultural differences within Asia, it, it, it just doesn't happen here. And you still see a lot of like pan-Asian restaurants, you know, where, where all of Asia is served in one kitchen, which I don't understand, you know, so you'll get these, these restaurants that. that serve sushi and rendang and, you know, nasi goreng and, you know, ramen and kimchi, you know, it, it's just, yeah, mm. all of Asia in, on a plate. And it's just kind so of- So I guess in that sense, you writing cookbooks and doing the TV shows, which are also shown in England, correct? In Great Britain? Yes, um, yes. That is your way of educating people about Korean food, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's, I think that uh, the, the Korean wave has definitely hit New York and, and, and the American shores as hard. Here, it's slowly starting to make its way through, through Europe, but, you know, obviously London is, is leading um, in that and, and some of the other big cities like, like Paris and um, probably Berlin, like the, the cities where they get a lot more international um, visitors. But um, I would have to say there's still, um, people still don't quite know what Korean food is. They think it's just barbecue and kimchi. They mm -hmm. don't realize that there's so many other dishes uh, that people think that everything in Korean food is spicy. Um, they, they, they don't um, know that uh, 
you know, there, there's, there's so many more dishes and, and that we have four seasons and things like this. <laughs> right. Judy yeah. and I talk about like, we have a lot of work to do in terms of like mm. globalizing Korean food and really educating people about what Korean food yeah. is. Mm. That's a good point. That's a really good point. But so speaking of which Esther, I know that you also host, you used to host your own podcast and do all these things. It seems like chefs these days are almost expected to multitask. It's not just about operating your own restaurants and cooking. It's like, you're supposed to write a cookbook. You are supposed to have your TV shows. And um, how do you choose which one to go for? What, what is sort of your criteria to go for certain projects? And then I know this is on top of you operating three and soon to be fourth restaurant. Um. I think that it just comes from like creative passion and um, yes, cooking is great and, and operating restaurants is great, but you know, I, I always want to go beyond that and push myself and like try new things and different things. And I think for me, ultimately, that's very important in terms of my professional career, just because I want to do more things and different things. Like I can go and open restaurants like all the time and keep opening more restaurants, but I've already done that. And I've proven myself to myself that I can open restaurants. So um, I get very bored easily. So, and that's like a big problem because um, I just keep on piling more work on, on my plate. And I think it's because I just, I just really like it. Like I just like new experiences in the end. Um, whether that be um, a failed one or, you know, something that doesn't really match, like, or what I actually don't like, whether, whatever the case is, like, for me, it's about experiencing new things. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I um, continuously um, try new things out and take on new projects. And it's, it's always fun. It's fun. Sometimes I hate it and I don't do it anymore. Then I move on to something else. So, um, yeah. So for me, it's always been that way. And it, it's always, I never say no to an opportun opportunity. Um, so whatever opportunity is there, uh, I will probably give it a try. How about you, Judy? What, what inspires you? What makes you take on all these different projects from the TV shows and cooking shows and your cookbooks and, and you're getting ready to open your new restaurant, which mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it's a huge challenge in this time period, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's an understatement. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that um, you have to wear so many different hats now. Um, in, in the whole chef world. Um, and I think that um, all of it though is, is synergistic and it all cross pollinates, you know, um, whenever you're on TV or whenever you have a book, it all promotes the restaurant, you know, when, when everything kind of fuels all, all of the other businesses. Um, and it's, um, it kind of is just like one, uh, just another spoke to a, a, a wheel, you know, and um, it is, it is about creative inspiration also, you know, you, you um, as Esther was saying earlier before, you know, um, when you, when you, ha when you own and operate restaurants, um, you don't get to cook a lot, which is ironic, you know what I mean? You get, you get um, swamped with so many other things. And so when it comes to, and, and you really become a chef, the, the, the whole point of it and, and the creme de la creme is because you love to create new dishes. And so when you do something like writing a book, you know, you can actually put all of that creative energy into something that um, is, 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 is productive and channel that into a book. And, you know, like my, my whole problem with, with my last book is that I could have done like 400 recipes and I had to like whittle it down to, you know, 125 or whatever. But um, that's kind of why you do it because you love to create, you love to innovate, you know, you, you, you like to, um, to, 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 show people um different flavors and um that's kind of why i love also kind of spreading and singing waving like the korean flag around because you know people love korean food once once they taste it and um 
and the food has so much to offer and it, it is it is so vibrant and so you know whenever uh, you know i write something or esther does her podcast or you know i i I, I, I do a book or I show up on TV or whatever. It's, it's all about spreading um, the love of Korean food out there. And, um, and also I think that it's, um, you know, it's important um, also, I mean, just cause, cause I remember when I was younger, um, mm -hmm. not seeing other Asian American females on TV or in the media was um, a big thing. Like, and I remember it was just Connie Chung and I just worshiped and loved Con Connie Chung. And so um, as much as, you know, Esther and I would like to say that we're not r role models, it, we're in the public eye. So we're a role model, whether we want to be or not. And um, some of the most rewarding pieces of, of fan mail or letters or tweets that I get are, are from, you know, mothers whose, you know, kids are, are cooking our foods or saying that we love your show. And, you know, my daughter wanted to be you for Halloween and dress up as a chef and stuff. And it's, it's just because there's so few Asian American women on TV doing what we're doing and even fewer Koreans, American women um, out there in, and in this industry, you know? Um, so I think that, um, you know, as much as, as we can, we need to kind of be out there in the media, um, kind of, you know, saying, hey, um, this is here. our food, this is who we are, and, 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 and we're here, yeah. Great. So I can go on and on and ask you many more questions, but it seems like our viewers also have a few. So I think I'm going to go to the viewers question. So this one's for Esther. Um, it came through email from Yoon who says she loves both of your restaurants um, that offer both traditional Korean and exciting fusion dishes. My favorite being your respective, inter um, respective in interpretation of disco fries. Um, what is the secret to developing a killer fusion dish that seamlessly blends elements from both Korean and other cuisines which all work really well together? What's your secret sauce? I guess that's what she's asking. Um, a lot of the menu items that are fusion on my menu are inspired from my childhood. It's literally what I like to eat growing up. So like disco fries, for example, I grew up in Jersey. Disco fries, we ate at every diner. Like I, it, Jersey is a very big like diner <laughs> um, state. So um, going to diners, <clears throat> pretty much like every night in college and uh, there was one dish I always ordered and that was disco fries it's just mm -hmm. like obsessed it's just like gravy brown gravy from like probably a jar <laughs> and cheese on it with french fries and so I knew that I had to put that on my menu but with you know obviously a Korean twist to it and you know what a lot of these dishes um that are fusion and seems like so well put together it's because we tested it a million times in the end right like obviously you always see the end product, but in the end, like chefs, we have to experiment all the time. And when we develop recipes, sometimes you have to cook it 10 times to get it right. So um, I think that's what is really important in the end um, mm -hmm. to, to come up with like a really phenomenal dish. You have to just keep working at it, right? Mm -hmm. You can imagine it in your head and usually when I do, it actually works out pretty well, but um, sometimes it doesn't. And then you just keep trying and tweaking it. And usually that's, that's how a really great dish is born. And this is a question from Helen um, for both of you. So maybe Esther, you can go first and then Judy. Um, are there any Korean dishes you love, but just haven't felt it would go over with Americans or Brits um, for um, you, Judy, that you decide not to put on the menu? Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of dishes like that. Oh, yeah, so, <laughs> so many dishes. I'm like, I know, like yeah. intestines, <laughs> uh, yeah. sunday, which is my favorite thing in the world. Uh, sunday is blood sausage, that's like my favorite thing. But I know if I put it on the menu, it's just like not gonna sell, like, it's mm. just not. Uh, when I first opened Mock Bar, I put um this dish called rainbow rice on the menu. I called it rainbow rice because it's basically um, aiba, which is um, different color row mm -hmm. with like kimchi. It's like a rice dish and we put it in like um, a cast iron. It was like 
one of my favorite things to eat, albab, torsel uh, albab is one of my favorite things. And um, so I put it on my menu because I was like, oh, it's like an exciting, cool dish and it's so colorful, it's so delicious, it's beautiful. Uh, nobody ordered it, like ever. Really? <laughs> it was so sad and it like broke my heart. <laughs> Like I was so sad to take it off the menu, but obviously it didn't last long. And there are many, many, many dishes like that. And you oh, sometimes have to, you know, in the end, we're business owners. We we have to, uh, we can't, like if, if we were to throw away something, like I just like, I get so sad. I get, I freak out over stuff like that. So we have to be able to like sell the items on the menu. How about you, Judy? I bet there were a lot of them. <laughs> Oh, a ton, a ton. And also, um, I was, I was able to kind of see it a direct, direct comparison because when I had my Hong Kong location, also the London mm -hmm. location, I mean, obviously in Hong Kong, like they eat everything, you know, and anything, it didn't matter what I threw on. It was, it was, it was selling, it was fine, you know, whereas in London, it's just like, I felt like a lot of it even just had to do with the way you called the dish or the way you described it, you know? So I had had the pop on. You know, nobody ordered it. I changed it to poke bowl. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, people are ordering it, you know what I mean? And so like, and so I, I you know, at first I was being quite adamant. Like I, I want people to learn the Korean words and we have to call it this and we're gonna, okay. you know, and I'm just like, you know what? Call it a Korean poke bowl. That's fine. If people order it, it's a poke bowl, you know? So it's, yeah. it's just, yeah, but it's true, you know, and it's like people just want to order what they want to order, you know, and, um, you know, I tried putting budejige on because I love budejige and forget it. And I made it like, like kind of like nice and with things that like English people like, like with sausages and like nice things, you know, and I didn't put spam in it, you know, and um, didn't sell at all. Um, so anything that's like too funky or too spicy or like, you know, it just, I just, I just can't get it to, um, you know, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just tough. So, but, and like, and my best sellers were the fusion things, you know, things like, you know, Korean disco fries, um, my bulgogi burger, my Korean fried chicken, you know, things that people recognize with a little bit of a twist. Yeah. It's really interesting because I tend to think that when I go to a restaurant, I want to explore new things and taste different things. But it seems like a lot of people actually go to the restaurant looking for that same familiar thing. So that seems to be sort of the uh, difficulty for a lot of chefs because people always want what they want, it seems like. Um, just another question yeah. for you, Judy. Um, how do you envision your new venture, Soul Bird, differing from Jinju? Oh, it's completely different. So Soul Bird is a fast casual concept. It's not, quote unquote, a real restaurant. You know, this is something that is going to be mirror, mirroring something like a Shake Shack. Um, so it's a fast casual concept, very small menu. It's based around my Korean fried chicken. Um, it's, it's based around chicken in general. I have grilled chicken and, and fried chicken, et cetera. So it's a very tight menu. Um, it's casual. It's kind of a, a gentrified fast food, if, if you will. So it's, it's very different, it's extremely different, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah. So um, one last question um, for both of you. What's your best advice for aspiring career changers? Uh, we're currently thinking of making the switch. I'm sure that's happening a lot um, in this time. Um, everybody's sort of wondering, is this what I really want to continue to do? Um, so what will be your advice for those people who are wondering about career change or thinking, of, you know, contemplating going into the cooking profession? How about you, Judy? Why don't you go first? Um, yeah, so um, first I'll say, um, it's a lot of work. Um, and I, I would say that um, I have more stories of failure than I do of success. And I'm sure Esther feels the same way. Um, this is a lot of hard work, um, particularly when you're a female in this industry also. And, um, you know, you can romanticize it and, and say like, oh yeah, you know, like, you know, you have books, you have podcasts, you have shows, you have restaurants and blah, blah, and blah, but it is blood, sweat and tears. So you have to really be care, you know, like be prepared to put 
in the hours and um, and be smart about it and don't give up. Don't give up. Don't you have to really persevere? Um, it is it's hard. I mean, you know how many times I was said no to from Food Network. How many years it took me for Food Network for Food Network to say yes to Korean Food Made Simple? And it was like three years of just like no, no. I mean, if not longer, you know, like the the food is too esoteric. It's too smallest to niche or whatever and and then i got two seasons and and whatever so it it is it is about pounding the pavement pounding down doors using every single opportunity that you can and um and and really just just working hard you know it's um but i say do it because it's worth it in the end because at the end of the day you're doing what, what what you love and it's so much more rewarding um working for yourself and um following your, your passion and not a paycheck. How about you, Esther? What would be your advice? I, I agree with Judy when it comes to like, be prepared, like be, be prepared to work like you've never worked before, which to be honest, sometimes it doesn't even seem like work because you love it so much, right? But um, in the end, there are a lot of rejections and you, it, there's a lot of competition, like cutthroat competition. And I, I would say like before making the jump, maybe test it out. Like you can always have a side hustle. Nowadays, there's social media, create a page, write recipes, just do it, just do it now. Like you don't have to make a whole career jump um before you like test the waters like that that for me like you can always start somewhere and for me i i would say do that and then when you're like really ready then you make the jump and then work hard i mean you should always be working hard anyway and this is an industry that you can't not work hard in it's just what it is and the well, well that, you'll die <laughs> i mean well you'll end up going back to your regular career which in um, New York, actually, the statistics are really crazy when it comes to culinary school. Out of, um, I, I think it was something like seven out of 10 people end up going back to their old jobs. Wow. And um, it is, it's just what it is because it is romanticized, this industry. It's not what it looks like. It's very, very, very hard. Like what you see um, on Instagram or on TV, it's literally the, like the tippy top everything else is just like, I mean, I'm not trying to like discourage anyone. It's just, you just have to know and accept or, or expect that this is just what it is. Um, and the restaurant, especially restaurant industry, like, and now with the pandemic, it's like, forget about it. It's just, yeah. it's just it was already, yeah. even when totally. it, was good, it was hard, but now yeah. it's just like, Oh yeah. my gosh. Like, I, I don't even know. Like it's, but but we're here, you know, but everybody helps each other. Um, and I, I think I want to just point out that like, like Esther and I have known each other f for years. I'm, I'm, I'm older and I, I kind of serve a little bit as, as a mentor, you know, if I, if I can, but, you know, and, but, but we're always help, helping each other. You know, I might call up Esther and I was like, I, I'm looking for that cool thing. I saw who was your supplier. You know, she might call me up be like, oh, I saw your model on this. Can you send me that Excel spreadsheet or whatever? You know, like we're always bouncing each other, ideas off each other. So, you know, it's just use your, 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 your network and support each other, you know, like it's, it's 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 so hard already you can't do it on your own you know it's yeah it's um yeah like asking for help and um yeah i i just i i do think that it is worth it though in the end because yeah, it, it doesn't even feel like work like for mm -hmm. me it's a lifestyle and you just mm -hmm. you have to know that it just becomes like your life it's, it is a lifestyle yeah. Like we live and um, breathe it every single moment of our waking life. So totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, like yesterday I was cooking all day and I, and I loved it. You know, I was just like, wow, I, I didn't even realize I was on my feet for like 13 hours, you know? And yeah. yeah. And then we're the lucky ones who get to enjoy your hard work in so many different ways. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have for now. So thanks to Esther and Judy for joining us Thank today. Okay. Wonderful conversation. Um, we wish all the best, really, and we sincerely hope to visit your wonderful restaurants in near future. Um, but in the meantime, if you are in the city, order from Mokbar's meal delivery yes. service. And yes, please. <laughs>
<laughs> and also you can learn from Judy's great recipes by ordering her book, Korean Food Made Simple and Korean Soul Food from wherever the books are available. Um, special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility. And to, of course, our Internet Extraordinary Gia for all you do. And um, of course, our thanks to you, our viewers, um, for joining us today. We hope you'll join us again next week. And check out what's coming on on our website, um, koreasociety.org, where you can sign up to receive our emails or join us as a member. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.